Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of the Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to CC with BB. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, and this is Connecting with Coincidence. If you wish to support us here at Connecting with Coincidence, please like and subscribe. Increasing subscriber numbers increases our reach. And those of you watching us on YouTube, write us one of your coincidence stories in the comments sections. We will reply. I have a message for psychotherapists. And if you are a patient, please keep this in mind. Most of you have not been informed of something very real about psychotherapy and counseling. It is hiding in plain sight. That something is simply this. Your problems, my dear therapists, walk into your office. Yes, the problems the patients bring to therapists are sometimes the very same problems that therapists are struggling with. The funny thing is that being a therapist is the only way to be in therapy without being the patient. Our guest today will discuss some of the ways synchronicity helps us with psychological change. Ken, Kenneth James is a Jungian analyst in private practice in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. James received his PhD from Northwestern University and a diploma from the analytical psychology from, from the CG, in psych, analytical psychology from the CG Institute in Chicago, CG Jung Institute. He has served on the faculties of several universities and also has been an administrator. Ken has led workshops around the world on the relationship between divination and synchronicity, and interestingly enough, on the use of the tarot to explore the unconscious. The synthesis of Jungian thought, clinical practice, and the numinous has been a strong motif throughout his career. Welcome to the show, Ken. Glad to have Thank you. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. Good, 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 because this is going to be fun, the psychological change and Synchronicity is really an important subject, and you're right there with it. Please tell us uh, one of your synchronicity stories. Yes, well, it happened many, many years ago. I was about 26 at the time, and I, I was a junior faculty member at a university in the city of Chicago, and I enjoyed my work, but uh, the university where I was employed didn't have a clinic and there was no plan for it. And I had been trained at Northwestern in a clinical program and it was always my goal to run a clinic in a university. But, you know, I was three years after my doctorate and glad to have a position, a tenure track position. And uh, so it came time to sign my third year contract and I did. And Shortly after I signed it, I got a phone call from a former professor telling me that at the university that she was then employed in, there was an opening on the faculty for a clinic director. And that was everything that I wanted. But I had just signed my contract with the other university. And so I felt I was stuck. And I wanted to take the new position and I went ahead and interviewed for it and was offered the position. So then I was really stuck. And I was very young and incredibly naive and didn't know what to do. I thought maybe there was something vaguely illegal about dropping one contract to take another one. And more than that, I was concerned at such an early time in my career, would that be doing something? that would affect my reputation and future employability. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to contact. Uh, 
the attorney that I had used for other things in my life was a, you know, a family attorney. And I don't think he knew much about uh, university law. And as I was thinking about this, I remembered that at uh, the university where I got my doctorate at Northwestern, there was a dean of one of the colleges, not the college that I was enrolled in, who was considered an expert on university law. And I thought, oh, that would be somebody I could talk to, except he's so important and I wouldn't even know how to contact him. He didn't know me. And as I said, I, although I was from the university, I wasn't from his college, but that was just in my mind. And I left my office one afternoon thinking about this deeply, worried about it. And I went to stand in line at the parking garage to pay my parking ticket. And, you know, this was in the 70s. So there were no kiosks where you could use credit cards. You actually used paper money and real people. And it was slow. So we were in line. And I'm kind of looking around because it was, you know, the, toward the end of the day. And I still was wondering about how I could deal with this dilemma I had put myself in. And as I was scanning, I turned around and directly behind me was this dean who was the expert in university law. And the reason I recognized him is I'd seen his picture because he was so well known. And I don't know how I got the gumption to just introduce myself. Need makes me, need makes us do things. <laughs> it certainly does, but yeah, I'm right. And I asked him if I could talk to him. Uh, and he said, sure, since neither one of us had anything better to do while we were waiting to pay for our parking. <laughs> and so I explained the situation and he listened very graciously. And he asked me a few questions. And then he said, you know, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Just go explain to the university why you're making the change. And this should be fine. You shouldn't be have any kind of impact. Um, so that's exactly what I did the next day. And he was right. The university wasn't particularly pleased, but they understood. And they knew uh, I had never made it a secret that I had wanted to work in a clinical program. And they knew they were not equipped at the time to do that. So I was able to take the new position and remained in that position for 30 years. So that was a, a really important event. And I didn't know anything about, I knew very little about Jung at the time, and certainly nothing about the idea of synchronicity or significant coincidence. My undergraduate training was in mathematics. So, you know, I was very interested in factual left brain, linear, provable sorts of things. Um, and this would have been way beyond my comfort zone at the time. But over the course of my life, as I entered my own analysis, studied Jung, and then eventually trained as an analyst, this story has always stuck with me as a potent example and a very important one because it wasn't simply a logical thing. It was emotionally impactful. This, this had meaning beyond just, phew, I dodged a bullet legally. It was much deeper than that. It made me begin to wonder how things were connected and, and what this web is that we're all sort of dancing in. Precisely one of the main reasons I'm into this business, because I think uh, coincidences have been and continue to be ways that we find out about how reality works. And, and that's what you got triggered into. That's what's happened to me a lot uh, is yeah. uh, what is this saying about how reality works? So you had this strong emotional reaction and mm -hmm. you, were, you were suggesting that it was more than just the practical, uh, uh, go ahead, Ken, you can go ahead and do this jobs that you really want to do and have done for 30 years. Uh, you can do that. So that was a big relief. You were able to go ahead and do it, but it had more, uh, you would describe it as numinous. And I, I, that term numinous needs, needs more description. Um, okay. It's, we'll continue to need more <laughs> description, but what do, what do you mean by, by that? So, you know, the numinous for me is 
the the attractively mysterious, the um, that which has boundaries beyond what my logical mind can really grasp. It it affects me. A numinous experience moves me to the brink of transcendence. It moves me to a boundary of my experience that I can't reach logically. I can't reach through, you know, sensor analysis of sensory data. Um, but it's also more than emotional. It's a sense of wonder, renewing a, an enchantment about this project we're involved in, this project of life. <laughs> this project of life. Yeah, it's a nice way of saying it. I sometimes think of this as Earth University. Uh, <laughs> And uh, one of the departments, or I prefer school being the study of meaningful coincidences or coincidence studies. Yeah. And we're, we're part of that imaginary uh, school because this is a project and we're trying to figure out what these coincidences tell us about how reality works. The, the implication of some of what you're saying is that it, it takes you into what might be called mystical uh, experience, yes. the, the sense of wonder that comes with knowing there's so much more out there than what we are conventionally told how to think. And that, yes. that experience did something to you, made you more curious, made you wonder, which are some of the more the, the benefits of thinking about synchronicity is that increases curiosity, increases a sense of wonder. Those are both health giving capacities that synchronicity helps us have. And it did that with you. But there's something else that made you wonder uh, when you wonder. And that's what numinous tends to imply. There's some, we're part of something greater. Mm -hmm. And we each can find ourselves having a role in it. And that's what uh, this experience did for you. But back, coming back down to the regular reality, um, I, math is an important part of all this. Uh, probability is uh, not exactly yes. math sometimes. Yeah. It's different right. schools, different math, uh, probability statistics can be part of different departments. But how has math informed you in your work uh, with uh, synchronicity? Well, the most valuable gift that mathematics gave me, and I think the most valuable gift math has to offer, is the ability to see underlying structures, underlying structures and dynamics within systems that can be clothed in all sorts of uh, costumes. So, you know, math is often called the handmaid of the sciences, because regardless of the science, uh, underneath it all, we can find mathematical structures, principles, um, fields and functions, and how one thing transformed into another thing, and so on. And math really looks for the unchanging in the ever-changing for me. And <laughs> that's a that, that that that's a really good line because uh, I came up I, I found changing ever yet ever the same uh, is a kind of a variation on that, uh, it, and that's what you're describing. Math gets to the what's what doesn't change. Right, right, and as you said, and I do consider probability and statistics a very important part of mathematics because it it helps us ground. Uh, our experience in something a little bit more objective so that we can begin to make generalizations, which is an important part of being alive, is to not have to repeat everything over and over and over again, but to figure that most likely this will have the same result if I do this same thing in the same way. Uh, and I think synchronicity would be one of those strange things in a mathematical sense something that is not necessarily accounted for yet by the theoretical structures that we've developed. And just as I used to joke around that uh, some of the newer areas of mathematics that would be particularly useful for psychology would be uh, the study of catastrophe, um, catastrophic studies in mathematics or chaos theory, because 
what we find is that even in what we would think of as subjectively chaotic or catastrophic, meaning a change that doesn't seem to um, be predictable from a prior set of circumstances, uh, this is very much what psychological life is is like. Yeah, you know, all of a sudden, puberty. Boom. All of a sudden. <laughs> You know, whatever. And all of a sudden she says she's leaving. Right. Right. <laughs> all of a sudden, right. And you go, wait a minute, how did that happen? And and yet we we are also given uh from the deeper parts of psyche the resources we need somehow to uh move through that. And you know, I remember a uh, a video of Marie Louise von Franz very late in her life talking about synchronicity. And the uh, interviewer said, well, what was the purpose of the synchronicity? He was talking about synchronicity in one of her uh, analysands. And von Franz thought for a minute and she said, well, you know, I couldn't see any meaning except it taught the analysand about the psyche, that the psyche knows things, knows things that we don't know. And it made the psyche more real for the analysand. Well, and, let's let's, yeah. let's get into that because mm -hmm. one of your um, thrusts of, uh, of research and thinking is the use psychological use of of synchronicity. Uh, so perhaps you go on to that one or some other ways of talking about uh, how synchronicity and and psychological change fit together. Well, often synchronicity serves as a hard stop for people as they're trying to figure out what they're doing with their lives. And, you know, I work with people across the lifespan. And as you well know, from your work, people are working very hard to live their lives. And they're doing the best they can. And sometimes things aren't working. But people so identify with their effort and so identify with their life that they can easily feel frustrated. And then a synchronistic event comes along and it, often the person will want to, well, two things happen. Either they'll want to disregard it yeah, because it doesn't it, make any sense. It doesn't fit with their paradigm about right. reality, yeah. Or they want to somehow make it all about them. Oh, well, I did this. I, th I thought this into being and, and it's used, unfortunately, to build up the idea that the ego runs the show. So the most important thing about synchronicity is it can't be predicted. It can't be explained by the ordinary paradigms. And it isn't something that we do. It's something that we endure, something that we experience. And one of Jung's primary principles of treatment is the relativization of the ego. So the ego is important, but it isn't everything. Now, this is a subject of uh, interesting debate uh, because part of my messages about coincidence and synchronicity is that we do play a part in creating them, but we play uh -huh. a part in creating them. And that we have uh, on one side, there's the probability of the event happening because there has to be a probability because it happened. Right. That's not a full explanation, even though statisticians like to say that. On the other hand, there are, there's weird stuff happening that is mystery and that ca carries us into uh, the unknown. And that's what's so much fun about this. But there's a part we play. And in your story, you got the gumption. Mm -hmm. You, without your doing that, of asking the dean of seeing him you saw him and you acted on on that without that happening without your doing that it would not have happened yes that is true right right so i guess for me the role of the ego would be to be an open witness and then to do something with it with what what has been revealed in the synchronicity. So sure. I could agree that, that the, the ego has a role. You know, for Jung, psyche and matter come from the same unitary place. It's been called the psychoid or, you know, 
Jung developed these ideas through his work with Wolfgang Pauli. Um, when I say that the ego shouldn't take credit, what I mean is I, you know, I'm not going to be able to say because of my intense thought on this person, I made him appear. And yet I had intense thought and this person appeared. <laughs> so that's a problem, sir. <laughs> that's a problem. And, and there are some people, as you know, who say you, you can manifest your thoughts yes. and yeah. that's what this would look like. So we that, get into this, yeah. we get into arguments about how things work and I just did a post for psychology today about how difficult it is to change people's belief systems or belief. It, and it, Period, it, yeah. it's, the title I wanted was how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, and they wouldn't use that one. It was too clever, I suppose, that the light bulb has to want to change. So you have to have the willingness of the person with the belief. And now you have a belief that I don't go along with quite um, that it's it's mystery doing it and a lot of people have that in there and I just yeah. pointed out to you where I thought you you did have something to do with it I think the problem you're referring to, I think the problem you're referring to is you get aggrandized that's better when it yeah. happens but you have to also notice that there's a you somewhere in there mm -hmm. and that yes. yeah and that's the point I am one of the points I'm trying to make because it's you it's either universe or or probability but in between there's us chickens making decisions like hey there's a right. dean I think I'll go talk to him yeah no I like that the idea of an aggrandizement or inflation you know that that the ego then begins to think it has this ability always and everywhere and maybe it does you know, but we don't always have to know that. Sometimes <laughs> I just have to cook dinner, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's another element of this. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and I was telling her about these energy exchanges I had with two people that she knows. And coincidentally, one of them, I didn't know she knew. Uh, mm. And she was living in the basement of the house that my friend was living in. And so oh, I wanted had but wanting to find out about this one in the basement because we had an interesting interchange at dance. And there, but now I could find out about it because she told me a whole story about this person down in the basement. And said, so, wow, okay. So she, she was involved with two people that I had uh, this interesting interchanges with. And she also was involved with it by being involved with my discussion about it because she knew things, she knew them. So what we also ignore sometimes is coincidences involve the other person too. Mm -hmm. So the Dean in your story was involved too. So yes, yeah. what did it do for him becomes the question because we tend to focus as you seem to have done on you and your needs and your feeling about that, which is what we mostly do. But there was the Dean sitting around, at least he has something to do while waiting in line. <laughs> at but, least, right. At least, but who knows what else yeah, that meant to him. I'd never thought about that before this moment. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Right. Because why would this person he didn't know have a question precisely in a field that he was an expert in? Um, I wonder what happened. <laughs> I wonder how that changed him. Yeah. And yeah. what need you might have fulfilled for him, too. Mm. Uh, but clearly smaller than your need, a 26-year-old confused and anxious. But yeah. still, what did it do for him? And that is a... that. What you just did here, as you can tell, is you were doing ego aggrandizement about yourself here. You did not. <laughs> that was what I thought. I didn't think about. It's just what I thought. I didn't think about the other person. Right. right. This you is didn't... my story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that for years, so I'm familiar with that one. That's why it was fun to be able to tell you about what yeah. you, what yeah, you were yeah. missing. Is it, there's a field that we're in, and you re mentioned earlier this web that we're all part of. And I think of coincidences as helping to create a cartography of this web. Say that again. I think of I like coincidences as helping to define the cartography oh, 
the geography, the cartography, the map yeah, yeah. how this reality functions. I, my, I have a new book that will be published finally, um, Inner Traditions, that I'm, I want to call uh, Charting Chance. Because mm. that's what I think this is, is making charts, including the charting of the map of how reality works, that we are all part of this web that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, I, I, that's very profound to me because of course the map is not the territory, but we have to keep making better maps. So. Amen, brother. Uh, and clearly the causal map doesn't <laughs> cover it. Right. It, at least as we understand cause now and right. And there's so much trouble with recognizing that not everything is not unicausal. There's multiple factors right. that come in, which is why I talk about uh, random uh, universe and person. There's multiple factors and different variables. And there's more to it than that, too. But yes, those yeah. are th three vectors that create three forces, three elements that create uh, the coincidence, the synchronicity. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's so much here with you, Ken, and uh, I'd like to maybe, if you can, talk more about the psychological and the synchronicity, uh, how they fit together, and if you have examples to illustrate some of these, <clears throat> that would be very, very good for us. Uh, so please go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to think in terms of people that I've worked with. Yeah. And you know, the, the idea of synchronicity or, or highlighting synchronicity in a therapeutic setting or an analytic setting heightens people's awareness of what I call the Fellini quality of daily life. The what? Fellini? F Fellini quality. Yeah, the movie. Yeah. The movie. Right, right. <laughs> There's a bar um, town town called Fellini, so I have to- Oh, is there? Right. Okay. <laughs> but you know how often in Fellini's films, things are strange yes they are they're kind of normal but they're kind of not and you know and sometimes when people come and to begin work they'll say well i don't know whether analysis is going to work because i don't dream and i'll say well that's okay we could pay attention to you know what i call fellini moments in daily life and they usually say what does that mean depending on their age some people know <laughs> who fellini never, is you know yeah. Yeah. And um, so I'll say, well, you know, sometimes things happen and it's almost like we have an experience that's bracketed off. It's like we're going along our daily life and then something happens and then we go back to our daily life. I want us to look at those things to see what they can tell us, you know, chance meetings or unusual occurrences, those sorts of things. And I find that when we talk about it, people become more aware of that qualitative difference that some events have over others. Mm -hmm. And then already, I think, we're moving out of the aggrandizement of the ego complex. <laughs> you know, the idea that, okay, I'm the captain of this ship. Well, I'm an important crew member, but the Ken project or the Bernie project or the Sam project or the Sally project is much bigger than that ego. And yet the ego bears responsibility for the outcome of the project or the progress of the project. And that means we can't afford not to look at every bit of data that comes. So give us an example, for, if you can, uh, from, your, from your work with people, uh, because this, the idea of synchronicity informed psychotherapy is something that you are doing, I'm guessing, but it sounds like you just, you are. And, mm -hmm. and, and using examples um, uh, is always, always a good way of- I know, do, I do have an example. Good. Um, I'm quickly working to disguise as many details as possible, but I will. It's Jane Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I know her, yeah, okay. I was working with a young man, uh, I think he was maybe 30. Uh, he was a psychiatrist and he came to see me and he had been through Freudian analysis and he just wanted to explore the Jungian because he had read about it and he thought it would be useful. And he would come in and 
I have chairs in my office. I also have a couch, a traditional analytic couch, which tends merely to be where I put my books. But he laid down on the couch so I could do whatever he wants. And we were working. And the first thing that happened was he, at one point in the work, sat up and looked at me and said, you're making this up as we go along, aren't you? (laughs) And I said, well, yeah, how else would I do this? So that was when he stopped sitting down, stopped laying down. So he sat up, sat on the chair across from me. And a couple of weeks later, at that time, our institute offered a lot of public courses uh, for people just to take. And he came in one day and, and again, in those days we published paper catalogs. And he came in and he was visibly agitated. And he threw the paper catalog down and he said, how are you Jungians ever going to get any respect in the psychological community if you run courses like this? And I said, what? And he said, there's some idiot teaching a course on the Tarot. Wow, can you imagine? And I said, there is, this was, (laughs) okay, I know you're a clinician, so this is my sadism, maybe. Okay, okay. I said, there is. (laughs) I just did that, yeah. (laughs) Who is teaching it? And he said, well, I don't know. And he picked up the thing and he looked, and of course, I was the one teaching it. So he said, oh my God. And I said, that's all right, I understand. But that kind of synchronicity or that coincidence that here he was critical of something but then a person that he had come to trust and work with was the person that also was carrying the shadow for this particular topic and we kept on working for quite a while after that and he even began to integrate the use of the tarot to the extent that he could in his work. Um, You know, I couldn't make that up. I couldn't create that circumstance. But we both could be open enough to using it. My explanation, at least part for that, is that he got the catalog. So he's curious about Jungians. That's what he's there for. Yes, right. And he scanned the catalog and subconsciously picked up who might be the teacher, although he was attracted Mm. by the tarot card thing, but somewhere it registered in him that uh, that was you, uh, but not in a conscious way because he was looking at it. Sure. And there it was. Now, so he kind of knew that he could be outraged with you without knowing that he could be outraged with you. And Mm. then that could do something for your relationship. So that what did that outrage that he helped create do for your relationship with him? I think because he had had extensive experience with non-Jungian intervention, I think it, it allowed him to feel safe to question to criticize and to challenge, which, you know, I welcome because that's the only way I'm going to grow. And if a, if a particular perspective can't be challenged, it isn't worth holding. So he somehow, you're suggesting that because he knew you and trusted you, he could be outraged at you and I'm assuming then that his need to express aggression in a controlled way was an important part of his psycho- psychological oh, yes. change. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I, right. My first post in Psychology Today was Jung Scarab as a psychotherapeutic intervention. Mm. And that's because it was. Yes. And here, this is another psychotherapeutic intervention. It's, again, psychotherapy. Psycho- synchronicity informed psychotherapy Mm -hmm. well let's let's take the the, some of the remaining time we have together ken to uh talk about the tarot oh okay oh because because uh i have had i was giving a talk at uh university of virginia a a little course and when i brought up tarot i saw some two very nice people walk out oh 
I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's, it is an offensive idea for a lot of people. I suppose, yeah. Uh, well, it is because it's bringing up um, something that divination mm -hmm. is uh, something only to be done by priests or somebody. Um, and it's not something that you do, even though people do open Bibles for, for help, uh, for advice about things. Um, what, what is the Tarot to you, Ken? That's a really good question. For me, the Tarot, if I look at it within the context that we're talking about, is a way to evoke synchronicity. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's almost um, taking a more active role in encountering a synchronicity. Yeah, I call it controlled synchronicity or dom domesticated. Uh, I like that. Yeah. It's, instead of out in the wild, uh, you bring it in. We're bringing to, it in, right? Bringing it in, so it's like control. Right. Uh, for for the people who don't know what a tarot what tarot cards are and what you do with them, could you give a, a a bit of a summary of what what that means? What tarot cards are? Sure. Tarot cards are a set of seventy eight cards that really are an amalgamation of two different sets of cards. One. Uh, a set of cards called the Minor Arcana, which is uh, a, a deck of 56 cards that looks very much like an ordinary deck of playing cards. There are some slight differences, um, but there are four suits instead of hearts, clubs, uh, diamonds, and um, spades. They are respectively cups, um, pentacles, swords, and wands. And there are cards ace through 10. And then instead of king, queen, and jack, there's a king, a queen, uh, a page, and a knight. And that's one subset of the cards. The other 22 cards are called the major arcana. And they really refer to um, more archetypal, uh, impersonal, transpersonal um, symbols and the tarot has been used uh, the, the artifactual evidence for the tarot goes back i think to about the 15th century but there are even earlier references to the tarot uh, that can take us back as early as the 11th century and there's a lot of folklore about it but it's a tool that people have used for many many centuries to tell fortunes um, divine I like the word divination because it really helps us see the divine in the mundane, which again, I think is something that synchronicity or coincidence does for us uh, because it can produce a sense of awe. And we enter into a dialogue with the images on the cards in order to become more clear about an issue or concern or question that we consult the cards about. So as you say, some people use bibliomancy where they'll find a line in the Bible or just more general stickomancy where they'll find a line in a, any book. Um, the tarot is a particular form of divination. Yeah, and uh, even the I Ching is a form of bibliomancy because there's 64 different right. pages you can turn to right. that have different interpretations. Right. But the tarot is wilder. Uh, it's, it is. Uh, it's, right. Yeah, there's so many different variations. It makes people not want to be involved with it sometimes because it so mm -hmm. can be so wild. Uh, there's a very nice explanation and description of it, Ken. Uh, and there's so many questions to be able to wonder about, like how did you get involved with? What's a nice boy like you doing involved with the tarot cards? Uh, a lot of Jungians don't pay attention to it, I think. Um, yeah. But what what I what I'm curious about um, is just is is what they tell you about the nature of reality, because that's part of what you're interested in. So, yes. so um, there, there you are, and there I have been shuffling mm -hmm. the cards. Okay, you break the deck up in your own way, and then okay, we're gonna do a, we're gonna spread out the cards. I do a past, uh, one card in the past, um, current mind, current self, uh, under current subconscious, and pathways into the future. Uh, so it's a 10 card spread and there's various ways people do that, right. but you do the right. spread and then you do the interpretation. And sometimes the person says, 
what? <laughs> how did you, what? How did you, how how'd that happen? And that's what I'm asking you. It's not what it might mean to somebody, because um, I've got I had a good time. I, a lot of funny things can happen with those things. Oh yeah. Uh, that, that what do they tell you about being able to do a spread of cards, however you do it, mm -hmm. and that they reflect the current reality of the person that you are dealing with, literally, and what do they tell you about how reality works, that that, that works? <clears throat> well, they, for me, they remind me, and I think they remind the person I'm reading for, that we are both more open than we think we are to um, being understood, and that we have determinants of our behavior, of our thoughts, our feelings that are going to have their way with us, whether we are aware of them or not. So it's probably better to be aware of them. Hmm. So that's the unearthing what's underneath that kind of making mm -hmm. the subconscious or con unconscious Con conscious, conscious conscious right where have i heard that before um, um i some guy some guy some um, swiss guy swiss guy who, yeah. i thought it was a german i thought it was an austrian guy um anyway oh that oh one. yeah oh him yeah, that yeah. one yeah well what <laughs> so our listeners know what we're talking about it's just freud versus jung right. and what a, I'm thinking about writing something reconciling Freud and Jung because they fit together in a oh, way yeah. that we we aren't recognized that that, Beautifully. that, that right. Freud was a personal unconscious, Jung was a collective unconscious in kind of simple ways, but Freud has his own ideas about parapsychological yes. things, but yeah. wanted to keep the black mud of occultism out of what he was trying to do, um, at, and and Jung was informing how how people individuate, and Freud was in, interested in that too. So they they have some overlap with each other. It's about time that we bring those fellows together uh, yes. with their with their contributions. But what I was talking about also is not just that we can get our subconscious conscious through tarot cards, but I'm what I came up with was I do these readings and it's like I'm throwing these cards up into the flow of reality, mm. like a, the Tao of the flow of Tao. And these cards in the moment are mirroring where a person has been, where they are now and where they're going. Where so they're going. It, it's mirrors of what's now. What yeah. do you think of that? I like that. I like it. The image I had is, you know, we think of time as a line. And I think it might be more useful to think of it as a tube, you know, just kind of going along. And what we do with the tarot is slice it at a particular moment and then turn it this way. Very good. That's Let's look better. at this, you know, yeah. and I think that it opens up our understanding of our relationship to time, but it also opens up our understanding of our relationship to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can can you give us um, uh, a, a tarot card story with somebody? I just had one and it slipped out of my mind. Slip, slip, sliding away. That's just right. Slip, slip, sliding away. Paul Simon. Um, oh, I have. Yes. Let me tell you this story. Uh, again, at our Jung Institute, um, we used to offer these public programs. And one year I said, I want to offer a course where we had quarters. For two quarters, I was going to teach people how to read the cards. And then the third quarter, I wanted them to be able to practice in a controlled situation. So we would bring people in, strangers, and have my students read for them. And so what I asked was that the participants in the class bring a friend or two. And I had the room set up with tables and all of the students in the class had their table and their tarot cards. And the idea was that it was kind of like speed dating, only tarot dating. Uh, you, the, the friends would go from one table to another and get a reading. And my goal was for my students to get practice in reading for strangers. Because that's kind of hard to, to do. You know, you read for friends, but am I really reading or whatever? And then I was going to pull everybody together 
at the end and allow my students to get feedback from the participants about you know, how good it was, how accurate and so forth. That was my idea. So we go through the night and people are doing this. And then they, at the end, I had the guests sitting kind of in the audience, my students sitting up front with me. And I was going to start the discussion. And it was very clear that the guests who had had readings were looking kind of jarred. So I said, what's going on? And it turns out what happened was, so one person might get four readings because they'd go from one reader to another. And very often, similar cards and similar readings would occur from one reader to another. And so it completely was the opposite of what I thought, you know, that my students were going to get feedback. We had to spend the evening consoling the people who had gotten the readings because it so disturbed their notion of reality. Because I'm sure they came as a, a favor to their friends to go get readings, you know? Um, so that was a great experience, at least for those of us who were in the class. Uh, and it's a good story. Uh, they kept getting the same cards. Oh, no. You're kind of, you know, and it's sort of, <laughs> wait, there is something to this. I don't know. <laughs> there's something, that tube, color, time, right. me, psychological, what, right. there's something going on here. And that's, right. that's the whole, to me, the, a big push to understand coincidences, because I learned uh, more about coincidences by doing tarot card readings myself. And yeah. just, just be, because they're, they're, they're controlled, but they're still the same mm -hmm. idea. So as, as we come near to the, to the end of our discussion today, Ken, uh, first, why don't you tell uh, our audience uh, that you're doing a, a, a tarot card, uh, a tarot oh, workshop. Yes. Yeah, I'll be doing a, a Tarot webinar, webinar. on um, Jung platform. We're just finalizing kind of when, when it's going to be. It's probably going to be late October, early November. It'll be a series of, I think, five or six uh, individual webinars that people can sign up for. They're going to be recorded, so they'll be available as well uh, after that. And what are they going to learn? Um, well, we're going to learn. Uh, well, let me look at my outline here that I happen to have. <laughs> just happen to have it there. What just have to have my outline. What so we're going to look at the connection between the tarot and Jungian psychology. Synchronicity and divination are going to be a big part of it. And then we're going to be looking at uh, the various parts of the tarot deck. I actually divide it up uh, a little bit differently than I talked about earlier. So in the minor arcana, I'll look at the cards with numbers on them called the pip cards and the court cards yeah to kind of see what they're we're looking different. at they they're are, very they're, different they're right different. then we'll look at the major arcana and i'll go through several ways of comparing uh different aspects some people look in as look at the 22 cards as three sequences of seven seven cards with the the fool as an outlying card uh, and then we're going to learn different readings basic past present future do a, a mini cross spread, a mini Celtic cross. And um, yeah, so it's going to be relating it to uh, synchronicity and rating, relating it to how the tarot can expand people's understanding and appreciation of their personal experience. Well, I agree with your, your, your outraged patient, Ken, who found that you are a troublemaker, sir. You seem like a very nice guy, but you're a troublemaker. I can tell because that's what you're doing. You're stirring people up. And the, the class where, where you weirded out the, the friends, you didn't do that. Of course, you had nothing to no, do with it. No, I had no, nothing, nothing to do, to do with it. With it. I can't, I'm, I must believe you certainly enjoyed watching that thing happen. It was, <laughs> I did, you know, when I finally realized what was happening, because it was totally not what I expected, I kind of did, yeah. Uh, did you have any follow-up or any ideas about what one particular person is of, of the friend group, having all those cards look the same to them, how that impacted them personally besides confusion? And wonder. There was one, yeah, actually, yes, there was one woman who afterwards came up to talk to me and she said, you know, I've been considering a significant life change. 
And she didn't go into it, wouldn't have been appropriate at that time, but she said, I just want you to know that this helped me understand how I could take responsibility for putting that change into play. And that is super wonderful. That yeah. is the psychotherapy through tarot cards is part of the whole game here. And there's all kinds of ways that reality helps us to change. And one of the things that you are very much involved with is synchronicity as a help in psychological change, which to me is like a fundamental of what most Jungians mean by synchronicity, synchronicity that helps people uh, psychologically. It's psychological yeah. change through coincidence. And that's what you just help that person do. So that's really sounds, that's really good, good work, Ken. Thanks. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Uh, so we've come to the end of our show. And uh, thank you very, very much for uh, a wonderful discussion. Thank you. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere like a hologram. Cosmic consciousness